Hi everybody, Seth Painter here, and we are back with our second panel of the afternoon. We are going to invite three, what, we got four experts up here to talk about first fill abandonment. And as they're joining us up on stage, Brian Zembrowski from Regeneron. We got Jim Doucette from AstraZeneca. Howard Seidman from Custom Connect, and Tim Glennon from Evofem. So join us up on stage, and we will begin the raucous conversation about first fill abandonment, which is a phenomenon that plagues us all, uh, no matter what we sell or what therapeutic area we work in in the pharmaceutical space. So I will allow you guys to introduce yourselves a little bit more. Tell us who you are, what you do, if a fun fact is appropriate, then you can add that, of course. Um, and then, of course, any disclaimer you want to add, please do. And it looks as if Tim is operating from the fourth dimension um, with regards to that background. So Brian, get us started. Who are you? Sure, my name is Brian Zembrowski. Uh, currently, I'm an associate director at Regeneron. I lead our patient marketing efforts um, in the respiratory space for a brand called Depixent, both US and global, uh, and have had about uh, 12 years of experience both on the HCP and consumer side. And fun fact is uh, I just, or I'm responsible for the uh, Depixent asthma TV ads that some folks might see. And oh, go ahead. <laughs> Disclaimer. Disclaimer. Yep. Uh, all these comments, thoughts, anything generated here is my own, uh, and that uh, does not reflect anything from my company. Gotcha, Howard. With the the light from heaven shining upon you. <laughs> yes. Hi there. I'm Howard Seidman. Uh, I run the Custom Connect platform for Populous Media. We are a SaaS platform that really forms the, the basis for a brand's direct-to-consumer digital channel with an eye toward converting browsing consumers to patients. Awesome. And uh, do you have a disclaimer? Nah. Okay. No, I Tim. do not. Nah. Yeah. Hey, good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, my name is Tim Glennon. I am the Vice President of Marketing at Evofem Biosciences. Uh, we are in the midst of uh, launching our brand new uh, non-hormonal contraceptive Fexi. Uh, we have been, I've been in the industry quite some time, 22 years. And uh, I, like Brian, uh, have a commercial out there right now. And uh, we just launched it on the 15th of, or pardon me, the 14th of February. So it's a real exciting time for us here as we're right in the middle of the launch. Uh, we launched on September the 7th. Disclaimer. I don't need to disclaim anything. No, I'm joking. Uh, much like everybody else, um, you know, whatever I say here is my opinion and not that of my companies. And can you probably turn down your mic volume a little bit because you're coming through uh, like my Sparkomatic AM stereo. In, uh, Let me see if I can do that for you. That's uh, a little better. And finally, Jim. Hi, uh, Jim Desad, Director for Partnerships and Collaborations at AstraZeneca and have spent the last 15 to 17 years in the health technology enablement, adherence, and digital health space building so <clears throat> engagement focus. Disclaimer? Everything I say is probably my own opinion. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's sort of a disclaimer. We'll get we'll get started here. So, Brian, you work in patient marketing, but if the patient never gets the prescription, what's the point? Yeah, no, I think, you know, when I think of first fill abandonment, right, I first first think about the patient and them not receiving the treatment that's probably the best for them um, and and the negative outcomes that happen because of that, right? Um, and we invest, particularly like in DTC, you invest a lot to get that patient aware of your product, educated on your product, and then um, you really reap no reward if, if they ultimately don't pick it up and, and start on that product. And Tim? Yeah, I mean, my, 
Yeah, I mean, you know, much like what Brian said, for us, uh, the real challenge right now is is really trying to get women start on product. You know, much like uh, he mentioned, you invest a significant amount of money and, you know, we're trying to figure out what the best way to get them on product quickly and, and keep them on product, uh, especially in this time of COVID. Now, Jim, you're not responsible for any particular marketing uh, therapeutic area, et cetera, but rather innovation across many different functions at your company. And so how does First Fill Abandonment play into some of the things that you've worked on or working on or may work on in the future? Sure. Uh, First Fill Abandonment is really important to us as it is to every pharmaceutical or biotech company. And we try to, or I try to, look at first fill abandonment a little bit differently in that we need to gain more what I call health psychology and behavioral science insights into the patient um, before we start to engage actively so that we don't have a missed opportunity. And what I mean by that is fundamentally, if you define patient engagement as the knowledge, the skills, the ability, and the willingness for a patient to manage one's own health, these are core functional components that we need to assess and measure constantly to be able to ensure or as much as possible uh, support that first fill uh, of that prescription as well as ongoing adherence for the patient. Um, Usually things and where I perceive a lot of things break down is around behavioral intent. Uh, We don't assess the intent for the patient to engage in their own health. And there's different functional or proxy scores that you can use to assess that. Um, and then build that personalization and customization that you're looking for for the patient. So what you're saying is sometimes it's not even our fault. Not really, but you have to remember that most patients suffer from a condition called anosognoso, which is a lack of insights or a failure to act, which is how they should be actively engaging in their health care. They know that what they should be doing, but they're not doing it, and they don't know why they're not doing it. Oh, I think that can be said of almost (laughs) any type of behavior in the human condition. But uh, Jim can type that into the the chat for everyone if they want to go ahead and look that up or try to spell that uh, the next time they participate in a spelling bee. Howard, from, uh, you know, the commercial side, from your side of the ball, uh, first fill abandonment. And what what do you see? Yeah, I... I put it into two different groupings. First, I put it into what Jim was talking about, kind of, I call that kind of organic abandonment, all right? In other words, people get a prescription and they just never get it filled. And there's a litany of reasons why. Um, And then the second grouping, I put it into a mechanical grouping. So when you look at it from, from that standpoint, you really need to talk about prior authorizations and customer communication. (laughs) See, in in the telehealth environment that my platform makes, it's a consumer's coming through. They are making a conscious decision to be educated in a particular med. They then go and self-assess, get qualified for a particular med, and then they make the decision to go to a telemedicine consult for a particular med. Um, and if it's medically appropriate, they hopefully wind up with a prescription for that med. Now what happens? In telehealth, they are traditionally a little kept secret about that is prior authorizations really traditionally were never part of the telehealth experience. These telehealth doctors are getting paid a minimal amount per consult to now ask them to do prior us, I mean, your brick and mortar doctor doesn't even want to do them. So unless your telehealth provider has a very robust, integrated prior authorization process, you're probably wasting your time, number one. A lot of people also think the pharmacy handles a prior auth. The pharmacy can't do a prior auth. (coughs) Only the doctor can. The pharmacy can fill out a little bit of info. At the end of the day, it's got to go to the doctor. So you really need a system in telehealth whereby the doctor um, gets that done and you could make sure and monitor that. And the second part of it to me is customer communication. 
um, if you don't have a very good communication path with your customer, you will see some of that first fill abandonment as well. Um, those are really the two mechanical things that we work very hard to try and do. I just have something. Patches. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Something to add because just popped into my mind. I think, you know, particularly with the PA process, but I think this also can build in across the board is around managing patient expectations and <coughs> um, what that looks like. Um, you know, I've seen in the past, um, especially with like a specialty product, you know, right? Where, you know, PAs are, um, are routine. Patients don't understand. I'm not, I can't just go down to the pharmacy and get this, right? And so, Really, it's about educating that patient on what that process looks like, whether it's digital um, or it's analog through the through the doctor's office. I found success, and you know, making sure that the patients at least they understand the process that can that can be helpful. Yeah, and I I think to add to what Brian's saying is, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, Kaiser Family Foundation published a study that said in the next five years, telehealth is going to surpass in office visits. And what's really nerve, or what's really sort of for us in pharma that we have to learn very quickly is that we need to adapt because that says women aren't going to the office where there's a little bit, or pardon me, women in my world, but you know where patients. Um, uh, there's a little bit of a hand-holding session that happens in the office setting where that is no longer existent anymore, and, there, and it puts a lot more on us, uh, onus on us as pharma, uh, in pharma to really try to figure out how to bridge the gap and help them educate that, um, or, you know, and close that gap. And so, you know, one of the things we did, going back to what James said, is we did a bunch of attitudinal segmentation with our customer, to not... Uh, with our potential target audience to understand it with the belief that attitude drives behavior. So we really tried to identify who those women were in this case for our product that would quickly adapt and who would be a little bit more down the path, so to speak. Um, and, and so it's really changed the way we've looked at things. But this telehealth platform, uh, I do a lot of work with Howard and we, we talk about communication constantly because we are always trying to close the, the, the delta there, if you will, between the woman coming in and ultimately getting product. So Jim, talk to me a little bit about what Brian and, and Tim just shared with regards to managing its uh, expectations and education, um, and then also bringing in the idea of a non-traditional visit with a clinician, because there are two sides to that, right? Uh, Tim brought up the hand-holding, uh, the comfort level with being in the office versus the convenience, let's say. Yeah, I mean, I think it all really fundamentally stems back to their beliefs and their cues to action on whether or not they're going to take action and fill that first script. Um, a lot of this goes back to what's called their health belief models and things like that that really should be assessed beyond when a patient um, because at this point they're given a script. We don't know if they're going to fill it, not going to fill it. I mean, the process is definitely one of the equation. There's other things like social determinants of health and other things like that, but it really comes down to, um, a lot of times, uh, for these things, looking at their beliefs and their intent along with how do we personalize that journey and beliefs is something really important to understand as it relates to their disease. So, for instance, if an asthmatic patient doesn't believe asthma is a chronic condition, they will not take a long-term control medication. What they will do is use their inhaler to treat acute episodes. Those kind of beliefs need to be understood up front because that affects first fill and refill after that, along with their intent to engage in their health and how we measure that as a proxy, and then also how we personalize that healthcare experience. Mm -hmm. You know, and healthcare at the end of the day is really defined as a human-centered interaction that's built on trust, confidence, and connection. And the patients need to have that in order to really stay actively engaged and involved with their health. Can I get that from a telehealth visit? I think you can get components of it, absolutely. I mean, the problem is it's a short duration. You're not really into the relationship building per se, but that may be okay if you're trying to achieve a short-term objective, which is I have a cue to action. I have a tightness in my chest. I have a wheezing. I have this, or I have some other external 
cue to action that I'm trying to manage my health and health telehealth and fill that gap. Okay, and we do have a question from the audience from Alicia. And the question is for brands with poor adherence and or high discontinuation rates, have you seen success in implementing patient adherence programs? And if so, what did they entail? What did they look like? So when we're thinking about first fill abandonment, that is a uh, specific segment of the patient journey. I would like to know, in addition to that, you know, is an is a adherence program going to address that or does an adherence program work while after the patient is on therapy? So I will add one comment to that is there's four types of patients, as we know in the clinical literature, there's a confident, a confused, a concerned, and a resigned. Most adherence solutions will support the confident, the confused. The ones that have high concern or are resigned in their healthcare because they have so many comorbid conditions, rather than start somewhere, I'll start nowhere. Those type of adherence programs don't typically resonate and activate those patients to engage in their health. They need a much more personalized approach, which is really around how do we figure out what's the right, what I call promotion response curve through machine learning and AI based on a behavioral pathway of what's the right messages, resources, interventions, and skill builders to keep them engaged in their health. And that looks very different than those confident and confused patients who need those general adherence support programs. And so what were the last two? I'm sorry. There's confident, you said there were confidence and confused. The bottom two were resigned. Concerned and, concerned and resigned patients. They okay. need a different think, level of support and personalization to keep them engaged. And would you think that those two categories are the ones where first fill abandonment might be the? They would be the ones that would be the hardest to get them high started. Risk. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they need that when we talk about the definition of patient engagement, the knowledge, the skills, the abilities and willingness to manage one's own health. There are components that you could use to support because they're core functionalities and they have to have a certain capability and skill level in each one of those core components to really start to engage in their health and do it in a meaningful way. BZ, yeah. patient adherence programs. I was actually just gonna um, build on what James was saying and that it really goes back to the behaviors and that segmentation that you do and the capabilities that that patient has, right? I think um, the success that I've had in the past with um, adherence programs has started there and understanding the patient and segmentation and, um, and then trying to tailor as best as possible um, to make sure for example, if a patient is hesitant or resistant to taking an injection, you know, how do we message appropriately to them to get them over that hurdle versus someone who may have uh, a barrier around, you know, cost, copay, or, or or in that arena? And how do you serve up the right content to them? So, I'm, you know, specific to like a CRM program. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that to me is, is you know more fundamental than what tactic or what um, what tool would work the best. So if I'm afraid of uh, needles, then and my doctor prescribes me something like that, I have a higher risk for first fill abandonment. We could try to soften that a little bit, try to yeah. assuage me into that with education and, and other materials. That's yeah. there. So that's one cool. right now. <laughs> I do an injectable product. <laughs> yeah, and so that's the, one, the one piece that you know we all we all need to keep in mind here is you know as well you know we're talking about the psychological piece. Let's talk about where it really matters, and that's in the pocketbook. And you know, oh wait, hold on, we can't know. <laughs> we're all not for profit companies, right? Yeah. And so, as we all know, that's um, that's where it really gets challenging. Is you know, with the with the landscape and the changing dynamics of payers and contracting and everything else that are going on. While we always talk about the patient, at the end of the day, in the in this world today that we live in, where people we don't know what their insurance is, and, and it's changing so quickly. Is once they see the out of pocket, I mean, there, there's only so much you, any of us as a company can do to your point, Seth, we're all not, we're not a not-for-profit organization and we all have investors to report to. Gotcha. Now, Howard, your, your product is an adherence solution. So how does that fit into what we were talking about? Well, 
Well, look, for, for us, because we are, we do that through patient engagement, um, we found it critical to tailor your user experience to the cohort you're addressing. So, so the days of having one generic experience and forcing consumers down that experience, in my mind, have ended, have been over for quite a while. Consumers have a very funny way of, um, of telling you they're not happy. They just abandon, all right? They just go away. Um, and if you're not tailor making your engagement of those consumers to fit the cohort that you're speaking to or gathering, uh, then I think you're doing yourself a, a great And I disservice. think that that's one of the most frustrating parts of this whole phenomenon is that there's no, like, they don't tell us. They don't, they just abandon, right? Well, Seth, you know, well, that's, Seth, one of the things, you. one of the things we talk about all the time, you know, as we're in the middle of a launch and, you know, we're talking about this trend and I'm going to, I'm going to liken this to Amazon for a second. When, when Amazon, you go on and you need a pair of socks, you order, you, you got 20 choices, you pick your socks and you push a button, you pay, and you're gone. As, as our patients now come into this, they want the Amazon-like experience when they're going online and into Howard's platform in particular. And, there, and Howard will tell you, there are some obstacles that we have to overcome, getting them to a pharmacy, getting, and especially if you have a mail order pharmacy, getting the patient to follow up with the mail order pharmacy. It's not just a simple point and click thing like it is on Amazon. And, and that does have an impact on abandonment as well. But we, and quite frankly, I haven't figured out the mousetrap yet that solves that problem. But we as pharma have a little bit of an issue in that place because we have certain guidelines we have to operate within and certain frameworks that really make it difficult to really follow with these women and the biggest of, being, of that being HIPAA. Gotcha. And I will invite the an audience to participate. Uh, ask us any questions using the Q&A function um, on, on the chat functionality. Uh, the only question we can answer is, well, we can't answer in black and white is why this first fill abandonment occur. So uh, let's move along to some technology options. Um, what can we do or use to try to mitigate um, this first fill abandonment issue? Is there anything that comes to mind? Um, you know, Tim and Howard, you guys were using the Custom Connect platform, but what else can we do? Uh, what else is available to us because we need to stick technology in this somehow if we can't get into their minds, right, Jim? Yeah, I think apps are a good way to go to support them in the white space area. I think also as we build solutions, we need to align them to where patients' um, expectations are. So, for example... They're looking for the experience of Disney. They want something pleasant when they come in. They don't want to be reminded that they're sick. And that's what they're doing. And that's what's happening every time they take a pill or they engage in their health. So they want something that offers them holistic support. You know, it's got to go beyond just, you know, the medication. They want to be supported holistically. They're looking for the ease and transparency of an Amazon at the end of the day. They're looking for the simplicity of an Apple. They're looking for the speed of FedEx. And lastly, they're looking for the precision of like a U.S. Special Forces in terms of the things that we deliver to them, the messages, resources, intervention, skill builders, things of that nature. You know, they want it when they want it at the right time, as we've talked probably in over and over again. Yeah. Brian, any uh, thoughts on sure. what we can do to intervent? Yeah, I mean, I think successful interventions can start right at that point of prescription and, and connecting to the digital tools that, that Howard and James and Tim have talked about, right? Like, is that a starter kit? Is it uh, maybe even some on-pack messaging? I know that's always tough, right? Because of the regulations that we have, but I've done some of that in the past. And I've seen it successful because, you know, that doctor at point of prescription, you know, they have the most impact with the patient at that point. And so if you can kind of continue that on and you've got a QR code or you've got other messaging or drivers, 
to connect to a CRM program um, or an app or whatever other tools that you might have to support along that patient journey through through first fill to to, to success of fills as well. Howard, any particular technological intervention that comes to mind? Yeah, we've, I think we've approached the problem right now. And for lack of a better term, for me, it's kind of a brute force approach because I don't think that technology is deployed right now to make this any more elegant. For us, it's don't disconnect with the patient, all right? So in other words, the minute you disconnect from the patient along the journey, you're, you're going to lose a significant percentage. You will never get them back, whether it's on the phone or an email, whether however you're speaking or communicating with that patient, the minute you disconnect, there, there's a void and, yeah. and there's abandonment. So we simply don't disconnect. Now, we can only do that clear up to doctor consult. All, all of our doctor consults are done right there on demand. We do not schedule, all right? It happens in one elegant process. However, now the prescription's written and um, we have to disconnect. It's impossible. Now, I, I believe we'll be deploying technology. I don't know if it's in the next 12 months. That's going to kind of enable us to walk through that gap, all right? But, but right now, the disconnect for us and Tim, please tell me if I'm wrong, is at the pharmacy. I, I mean, the one steady process ends at the end yes. of the console. And now they have a prescription. It's written. This is where the whole is for Yeah, us. Seth, a couple of things to add on to what Howard said there. So, look, I'll tell you as a launch brand, we, we came out of the gates and I thought we were pretty innovative. So we, we worked with an online nursing group that sort of followed the sun across the country. They had they they were there as a counseling tool for the for, for the patient, whether it was about Fexi or whatever their whatever their product of question was, they could ask questions. Um, you know, as a marketer, you always look at it and say, "What is my ROI on it?" Don't know, but it was a service provided, a you know, a, a peace offering, if you will. But you know, one of the things we also did, to Howard's point, was we implemented a text program very shortly after launch, and so every patient, whether she was in an office or out of an office or using telehealth, would get a text, and to to, to try to cut down on this abandonment rate. And to be honest with you. We still have abandonment. I can tell you, I can see it. But, you know, is it better or worse? Hard to say at this point because of what Howard just said. And, and the critical point here is the pharmacy. My brother's a pharmacist. They're super busy right now. And, you know, they don't have time to really pay too much attention. I mean, they're pretty much a mill uh, of running prescriptions through it. And the, the best solution is probably a specialty pharmacy, but as we all know on this phone, specialty pharmacies, co pharmacies come at an added cost. And so those are the situations you really have to weigh, and it just depends on your brand. But I, I still think the challenge we have right now, that to Howard's point, we haven't really solved the problem, is getting them from point A to point B. Uh, unlike what Jim just said, if you can keep them in one place and, you know, they have speed and efficiency and, and it's simple, uh, a one-stop shop, if you will, it makes it a lot better mousetrap. Okay, final question, one word answer. I go into the doctor. I used to get a piece of paper that I left with. Now it's ERX, it's sent to my pharmacy. Which do you think is more responsible for first fill abandonment? Paper, ERX, or you could say both are equal, Ryan? I'd say it's tough without knowing the exact patient. <laughs> uh, I, I guess for me, probably ERX, just because you don't have the physical piece right there. Assuming everything else. All right. Is the same. One word answer, Howard. Uh, I would say okay. paper. Tim? Because Easy for me. <laughs> Easy for me. ERX. All right. ERX and Jim? I would say paper. Okay, paper. So. Um, I like to leave with something, and that usually reminds me to go get it. If it's stuck at CVS, I never go get it, but that's my own personal opinion, and don't reflect uh, the opinions of my company. Uh, thank you, panelists.